Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Okay, so we continue with where we left off in the last session on the topic of cables. Just to recollect, what are the assumptions we make in analyzing cables? Two key assumptions. What are they? Number one, perfectly flexible, which means it cannot resist any bending moment, cannot resist any shear force, cannot resist any actual compression. The only one force that it can resist is actual tension. Okay? And uh, a good example is a string. And the word in Latin for string is funicle. That's how the, the concept of funicular structure comes. Okay. Second, it is in, inextensible. No change in length is possible. Okay. So you recall this uh, nice derivation in the last class where we said that the reason why bending is eliminated, one reason is because it's flexible, it just doesn't have the capacity to resist bending moment. But even if it has the capacity to resist bending moment, like an arch, which is relatively rigid, this is like an arch. Uh, somehow the bending moment gets eliminated. Now let me draw an arch. Can I call this an arch? Yes. The common man's understanding is this is an arch. Yes or no? But for a structural engineer, this is no arch. Why? Why? Give me a correct answer. Raise your hand and give me a correct answer. One of you. This is not having the structural efficiency that an arch should have. A structural efficiency comes when the arch is subject to pure compression, just like a cable is subject to pure tension. This is an ordinary frame. And in a frame you can have at any section, actual force, shear force, bending moment in any proportion. But in an arch, ideally, the main internal force should be actual compression. You won't get that with this. Why? Support conditions. So, what's the problem with these support conditions? It's quite rigid. It won't move. Don't think it's going to move one meter and all that. No. A few millimeters. Small movement which anyway frames will have. What's the reason? In one support, there won't be a horizontal where you have a roller support. And if you have only vertical loads, and right now we'll concern with vertical loads, you have only vertical loads, then in the other support also you won't have any horizontal reaction. So what's the problem? No horizontal reaction means life is easier, no? What's the problem, you tell me? You need the horizontal reaction. Why do you need the horizontal reaction? Huh? Yeah, so you'll understand that when you have any system like this, like a frame, subject to gravity loading, if it's simply supported, then it will be subject to sagging bending moments. And you can draw a bending moment diagram. Uh, even for a frame like this, 
the bending moment diagram, free bending moment diagram is a word we use, is m naught of x, simply supported, subject to gravity loading. Agreed? Whether concentrated or UDL, it doesn't matter. Now, if it has to be an ideal arch, a funicular arch, there should be no bending moment. Even if the arch has a capacity to resist bending moment, there should be ideally no bending moment. Which means at every section, the bending moment should be zero. Which means the sagging moment must be neutralized by an equal an opposite hogging moment. And you get that hogging moment from two elements. One is from the horizontal reaction, which means both ends should be either fixed or uh, hinged. So first you must have a horizontal reaction. Secondly, yes, you need a height. You need a rise in the arch or a sag in the cable. If it's perfectly horizontal, no use. In other words, you need this HY. You need the HY. It is the fact that if you cut a section, you have a horizontal force which will generate a couple with the help of the reaction. Whether it is an arch or a cable, you will have that couple. That couple will generate a hogging moment and that hogging moment will reduce your sagging moment and in an ideal arch it will eliminate it exactly which means your net bending moment will be equal to zero. This is guaranteed in a cable. Why? Because a cable just cannot resist any bending moment ideally. So it will happen on its own. In an arch, it won't happen on its own, right? You will get some bending, but certainly the bending moment will not be so high. Sometimes this value can be higher than this value, and you might have a net hogging moment in some locations. We'll see all that later. But you see a great advantage in being able to generate a horizontal reaction. That horizontal reaction, if you cut a section anywhere in the structure, it will be constant at all locations. It's all equal to H. It's like H is traveling from one end to the other end, whether it is an arch or a cable. H is constant. And there's a name given for it. It's called horizontal thrust in an arch, which is a short form for horizontal component of axial compression. Axial compression is called thrust. In a cable, it's called horizontal tension, which is short for horizontal component of axial tension. Okay. Now this axial compression and axial tension also has a vertical component. What is that vertical component? That vertical component is nothing but the equivalent shear in the simply supported beam. And that can change from location to location. And because that changes, the axial force will also change from location to location. Right? And what is the actual force? If you say the vertical component, the shear is V and the horizontal component is H. V is a function of X, H is a constant. What is N, the actual force? N is given by resultant square root of H squared plus V squared. Are you getting it? That's it. And if it's a, if it's is it possible to get that equal to H? When will the actual force be equal to H? The minimum value of the actual force must be H. Why? It's square root of H squared plus V squared. It will be equal to H only where V is 0. Give me an example of V equal to 0. Huh? Uniformly distributed load. Yeah, at the center, like in a simply supported beam, the shear force is zero at the center there. And how is it related to the shape of the cable? So you will find the slope of the cable will be zero. So if you cut a section there, you have a perfectly horizontal resultant force. So you, you get something interesting coming out of this. 
the slope, the inclination of the cable, which decides its geometry, is totally a function of the vertical component of the axial thrust. Where the vertical component is high, the slope will be high. Where it is zero, the tangent will be horizontal. Are you getting it? So, geometry, kinematics is completely married to statics. We earlier said it's not easy to understand, but in the case of a cable, it is a given. The cable will keep changing shape depending on the loading applied on the structure. So what we learned from the last session was, if you see a structure with two hinges, hinge joints here, and if you imagine it's simply supported, one of the supports is a roller, or theoretically both can be roller if it's subject to only gravity loads and you don't worry about stability, then you will get some bending moment diagram in the equivalent beam for the loading. <coughs> and in your mind, you should always be able to visualize the distribution of bending moments. For example, a concentrated load will give you a triangular bending moment diagram like that, right? If your structure is shaped like the bending moment diagram, at least the outline of it, either down or up, then you can say, fantastic, for this loading, that shape is funicular, meaning this equation will hold good. <coughs> Even better, this will be equal to zero, the moment will be equal to zero. Why? Because if this is equal to zero, then the shape, the vertical ordinate, the rise in the arch or the sag in the cable will be m0 divided by this constant h, whatever the value of h is, which means y of x is directly proportional to m0 of x. So the shape of the bending moment diagram will be the equivalent bending moment diagram in an equivalent simply support beam for a given loading will be the shape of the cable whether you like it or not. Automatically the cable shape keeps changing depending on how you apply the load. In an arch, unfortunately the arch is rigid, it can't change shape but it will be funicular for one particular loading. For others, there will be some bending moments and shear forces for which you have to design. Clear? Okay. Now let's go into the analysis proper. This is a cable subjected to concentrated loads. Hmm? So in your mind straight away you should visualize the bending moment diagram of a simply supported beam. And then you can guess the shape of the cable will imitate that bending moment diagram. That's how you draw. Of course, it depends on the relative magnitude of the loads, but it will be piecewise linear. You know this from the previous discussion. This is guaranteed. And the word sag is usually given to the, the maximum value of the value of y. Y is the, the height of the cable at any location with reference to the horizontal reference axis, assuming that both these supports are at the same level. Now some people ask, should this be hinged, can it be fixed? What's the answer to that? You go back to the previous slide. This, can I make this instead of hinged support, can I make it a fixed support? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> uh, what do you mean by yes? Is so, oh, how do you define a fixed support? No, uh, how do you define a fixed support? How do you define fixity? there is no rotation possible for the support or for the member connecting to the support. 
member connected so there's uh, you know you can draw any shape you want but the reality is if you tie a string to a fixed support <laughs> it's it's a wrong statement because the cable the string can always rotate there's no way it's so flexible it will always rotate so the concept of fixed support is a myth you can draw it no harm but you should know that if you really want to model it you have to model it as a hinge support in an arch on the other hand you can fix but if the shape is funicular even though it's a fixed support the bending moment for a funicular loading will be zero so it's just like your bank account savings account you have a savings account in your name in which you can have 10000 rupees but normally the balance is zero rupees it's like a fixed support in which you can have any moment from zero to infinity but it can be zero sometimes and for students usually not you guys you guys are getting scholarships no so you might have uh, do you understand what i'm saying so be clear you don't say it can be fixed you can't fix a cable there's no way you can fix a cable it's too flexible okay so this is called sag and we use a notation h and if you call this left support a and this right support b then the lowest point we call c and so the sag is h at c okay right so you have the geometry is defined by y of x right y is 0 at a and b and y is maximum at c and that maximum depth is called sag all right now let's try to analyze this it's got many loads let's say the resultant load is w you add up all these values it become w and let's say the resultant load acts at a location a from the left end or b from the right end the moment you have this description v a and v b become become finish the sentence v a and v b become no 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 v a and v b are here shown as vertical components of the reaction that a and b but the moment you know value of w and a and b so the correct statement is v a and v b become statically determinate you can apply equation of equilibrium take moments about either a or b and you'll get you'll get v a is w b by l and v b is w a by l and it doesn't matter what the structure is you can put a boulder there you can put a frame there you can put anything there and if these two supports are at the same level w will be shared between <coughs> va and vb in this proportion we know this very well now right even intuitively you know that if w moves to a then va will be w and vb will be zero and vice versa all this is intuitively obvious right what about h how to get h can you give me a formula for h h is statically determinate or indeterminate h is is the structure statically determinate or indeterminate a huh? determinant then how to get h give me a formula for h a huh? the bending moment at actually the bending moment at any location divided by tell me the i have given you all the notations here now the bending moment the free bending moment in the equivalent beam at any location divided by horizontal, horizontal. i want to find h <laughs> divided by the the y sag word we'll use for the maximum value by so m not of x divided by y of x but unfortunately you don't know the y everywhere Uh, but maybe you know the y here hc the sag you know you can measure it 
So that's how you get it. Okay, so you can get, by the way, the variation of shear force will be like this in an equivalent simply supported beam. Va will be maximum here, then it remains constant, then it goes down by the first load, then here it goes down, it changes sign, etc., etc. Vb is this, and your bending moment is piecewise linear, this is M0C. And uh, so you can get, remember this equation, your H is given by this, and if you know at one place, if you know at many places, <laughs> will you get the same H? Oh, be careful. Hmm? That's why they say when you make a drawing in, in practical design, they say don't give too many dimensions. Let's say you have many columns, you're drawing a plan, and you've got grid lines, and you give distance from here to here is 10 meters, and then you give small distances, 1 meter, this 2.5. Normally, one of those dimensions you should leave out. You know why? If you give all of them and you change one of them and you forget to change 10 meters, you will have an error at the construction site. Right? So you should not have redundancy unless you can check it and verify it. And usually uh, that's the uh, practice so that you don't make blunders. Is it clear? Usually 10 meters is fixed. You can't change it. The foundations are made. So similarly, it's uh, play safe and give only one value and these must be in the proportion to the bending moment here versus the bending moment there. One value is all that you should give. You, you will get actually in a problem. Clear? Okay, so is this, this is familiar because we started with beams and then for us cables are now child's play. Very easy. And then remember we discussed this, the actual force in any segment. The actual force is constant from here to here, from here to here, from here to here from here to here, from here to here. In any one segment, H is constant. Only this fellow varies and that magnitude changes. It doesn't matter what the sign is, shear force plus or minus. That's only a matter of convention. But the magnitude of it decides the value of V and the inclination. The inclination will be maximum. So, so someone may ask the question, tell me what's the maximum cable tension? So, if you are in doubt and you like to slog a lot, you will calculate all the five cable tensions and then you will pick the maximum <coughs> value. But if you are smart, you will see which, where is the V maximum? Is this max? It will be in one of these two ends. Is this maximum or this maximum? Which is more? And, well, I have not given you the values, so this is a schematic diagram. <laughs> okay, but it won't be in between. And you pick whichever is more and apply this equation and find the, share, find the value and you'll know the angle also. The angle is also given here. Let's do a simple problem to understand. Here's a problem. A cable with two concentrated loads with the supports at the same level. And you're given the sag at C. This is A, this is B, C, D. And you are given these horizontal locations. The question is, find the support reactions, find the cable tension, so you have N1, N2, N3. And also find this, the sag at B, YB. And also get the total length of the cable. The cable is inextensible, so this is something all of us can do. We will do it together. First, we'll find the reactions. Well, vertical reaction will be very easy. 10 kilonewton. How much will go to VA? 5 by 7 times 10. And two. So you can do this. This is all child's play. You can find the two vertical reactions taking moments. Okay. And do a small check. This plus this must add up to 10 plus 20, 30. That check you have to do in all problems. Why? Because if you make a mistake here, you will get blunder. So always check. And intuitively also you should guess, look, the heavier load is here, so this fellow will be little more than this. And that's true. VD is more than VA. All these checks you should do in your mind. You must have a feel that you are not making a major mistake. Clear? All right. Now, 
how to get H? It is simply, well, you can take this free body and do it or you take M naught C and divide by H. Well, it's the same thing. Okay, you're saying the bending moment, if you cut a free body of that last segment, the bending moment here must be equal to zero. And this height is known, so MC is zero, which means the couple created by H is neutralized by the couple created by VD. So VD into two is balanced by H into the sag, 2.2143. And so you solve the equation, get H. Got it? Very simple. Then to complete the whole thing, you've got three free bodies and you can pull out the resultant of H and V. V1 will be the first reaction, V3 will be the uh, second reaction and this will be the difference between VA minus 10 kilonewton or VD minus 20. Both will give you the same answer. Got it? This vertical component only is changing, H is not changing. And the resultant actual force inclination will keep changing depending on the relative magnitude of V and H. Okay? So you can draw this to understand it and calculate the values. Find V1 first and then find it N, N1, N2, N3. And as you can guess, N3 will be maximum because VD is more than VA. N2 will be the least. Okay. Now, I, I see that in many textbooks and all, they, they actually work with angles. My suggestion is that's all complicated. A good understanding of shear force and horizontal thrust is all you need. You can also calculate the angles, but you don't really need the angles. There is one more part of the question. That was, what is the sag at B? And what is the total length of the cable? Now, to get the sag at B, now you can cut a section here. And you can draw, you can now work out, take this fellow. You know the bending moment at B is zero. So the couple created by H, H into the unknown YB must be equal to VA into 2 meters. That's it. So you apply that equation. VA into 2 meters. VA you've already calculated and H, H you already know now. Now you know H, but the unknown is YB. You can find YB. And how do you find the length of the cable? It's a, just the a sum of the lengths of these three parts. You have the coordinates of B and C, so it's, you can easily do this. 2 squared plus this height squared is this segment. 2 squared plus this squared, square root is this segment. And this change in elevation between this and the quantity which you just calculated. So common sense, right? Very simple, straightforward problems in cables are sorted like this. Now the problem can get tricky. Okay, by the way, sometimes you can use the binomial expansion. If you use a binomial expansion, uh, it's possible to write it like this because after all, it is a sum of the, it's a function of the angle. So it's delta x squared plus delta y squared and the square root and summing over i. And this quantity is small, so you can write it as a summation. It's a series and you can take as many terms as you want, but you'll find that it's not as accurate as this, but sometimes you may need, you can use this in some situation. Is it clear? Okay. The answer works out, and if you consider the first two terms, it works out to some. So it depends on the number number of terms, number of terms. So this is a more realistic problem. You have, let's say you go and buy a clothesline, and you tie it. What do you know for sure? Not the sag. You know only the length of the cable. And then you put your hanger, two shirts, you hang them, it takes a shape. And nobody is going to measure this. You won't even know what that difference is. Let's say you are given this information. How will you solve the same problem? It's more realistic. So instead of giving HC, you get the total length of the cable. And now 
you analyze the cable and find the sag and you, you can do this whole exercise. How do you do this one? Tell me. It's a little tricky. Earlier one was easy. Now you have the length of the cable. How will you do it? Any suggestions? You are all smart kids, you can crack this. See, finally, how did we get this length? We got it from this, plus this, plus this. But you didn't know this. You know two, but you don't know this. You don't know this, you don't know this. So how do you do it? Just some ideas from you. Finally, you know there is a solution. And you also know the solution. Whatever you did must is exact. So these answers are correct. Because I'm giving you this solution. So there is a unique solution out there. And I have enough information. I must be able to crack it. How do I do it? Now this is all left brain, right brain is not needed. It's all logic. Like uh, we have, have, to, have to make sure to calculate the uh, slopes and uh, from there. From the slopes? You can do it any way, but just give me a simple way to do it. Remember how we learnt all those, remember the old days, arithmetic, algebra in school. You know, one unknown there will be, some x. You write x, then you have to find x. So which unknown will you take here, x? Take the sag. Okay, so that's, you can do that. Let this be the unknown, hc, you don't know. Okay. Anyway, the vertical reactions are the same as you got earlier. They don't change. And HB and HC you don't know, but you know a relationship between HB and HC. That's interesting. What's the relationship between HB and HC? The bending moment at B and the bending moment at C and the bending moment anyway must be equal to zero. So once you know the vertical force here and the vertical force here and you apply this equation you can get h capital H small h at b equal to this and then if you take the ratio you've got a ratio of this to this that's interesting right hp to hc that's all you need the profile of the cable is known now this is the equation you want you can rewrite it like this and you've got this equation clean now you have only one unknown HC. Hmm? You got a, an interesting equation. How will you crack this equation? Hmm? These are problems we all commonly encounter in, in life, in practice. As uh, engineers, we should be able to do it like that. How will you get HC? You have a calculator with you. Nowadays you have computers and all programs and all that. This is called a transcendental equation. How will you crack this equation? Bisection. You can use a bisection method. You can simply do it by trial and error. How do you do by trial and error? You have to guess. So guess the value of HC. What's a good guess? No, don't tell me the value of HC will be. 2.2143, that's too much of a guess. <laughs> Take some funny guess. 2 meter, why? Two, uh, look at the geometry of this. Oh, wait, wait. Look at the geometry of this and say, look, to scale, if this is 2 meter, this must be around 2 meter. Okay, take 2 meter. Do it. So put 2 meter, then you, if you add up this, you will say you are not getting this. Then you will say, it has to be more than 2 meter. Okay, take 3. No. Then say, no, no, it's too much. 
Oh, you take 2.5. That's how you do it. But you can do it systematically. The bisection method, I don't have time to explain that. We'll give it to you in a jiffy. Or you can use, so you can do it and you'll get HP and HC, right? Uh, okay, here it's a, a little rounded off. And then you can solve. You, you got this earlier, you can solve and get the problem. You can use a binomial expansion and also do it, but I, I, I don't recommend Nowadays, everybody will do it by some sophisticated method. Okay. Now, if supports are at the same level, that's all you have to do with constant loads. We have learned everything. Now, we look at something interesting. Okay, supports at the same level, we know that the vertical reactions are, are known. And we'll give them v in the name VA0, VB0, okay? And it's a summation of the loads. <coughs> this we know. For the, every load, you must know BI and AI by L. And, okay, if you cut a section anywhere, say here, the bending moment must be zero. So, how do you find, so what you get here is a free bending moment in the equivalent beam, right? So, somehow you must get that equivalent bending moment and that must be equal to H into Y of X. So these equations we know. So, this we also know. All this is basics. If supports are at different levels, let's say B is slightly lower, and everything else is the same. The location of the load is the same. What change do you expect? Those who have already st studied, keep quiet. Others, what change will you expect? You have one situation like this. You have another situation like this. These loads have not changed. What will change? What will change? Now, what clear answers. Will V A and V B change? Will H change? H won't change. Why H won't change? Why H won't change? You like H. What's the reason? Why V A and V B will change? Why V A and V B will change? What is the difference between this problem and this problem? Can you tell me clearly? CG is the same, and let's say CG is the same. Loading is exactly the same. Exactly the same meaning in terms of X location. It's statically determined. Why? It's a cable, your bending moment is zero everywhere. It's like a sinking of a support. Like a sinking of a support. So what will happen? If I have a simply supported beam and the support sinks, nothing will happen. There will be no bending moments. So it's not like a sinking of supports. If I have a beam in which the vertical loads are acting and I have these reactions, if the support sinks, what will happen? Vertical reactions will remain the same. Unless I have a horizontal reaction. But that you can look at this. Don't go to sinking of sinking of supports. We don't normally have horizontal reactions. So tell clearly. How did we get these answers so quickly? What was the basis for this? It depended only on gravity loads. Here. Will the reactions depend on gravity loads or something else will kick in? Huh? H will also come into the equation. That's the main difference. H will come into the equation. Okay, that H will it, which for this orientation, it will increase VA or VB? Hmm? Okay, because Okay, now let's say that this HC is, HC, uh, in fact the SAG is always defined in relation to the cord joining the two supports. That's the definition of SAG. It's not, it's the, first you take a reference line joining the two supports and wherever 
and your y can still be with reference to your axis but h is with reference to the chord so h of x is a new term we'll call and this is called hc so your reactions va and vb will be like this and h will act like that right the difference between this va and vb and this va and vb is the presence of h which gives a couple h into yb which has to be resisted by an additional equal and opposite set of forces delta v here and here right and if you really compare this with this whatever you define v a not and v b not will still be there but this additional thing will also be there this will increase by h into y b by l and this will reduce by h into y b by l got it does it make sense that's all that happens and if you apply moment at any location is the same then if you substitute for va with this quantity you'll get something interesting you will get this and it goes to prove that if this h is matching this y in if the sag is the same in this and this then the h will also be the same in both only if that is true you can prove that okay let's just it can be proved uh, by sheer logic if you are maintaining the same sag and you just gave it a rigid body drop of yb then whatever horizontal thrust you got here will remain here because you can prove that this small h of x by similar triangles is related to y of x through this you have to subtract y of x minus x divided by l and that comes into this equation so that's an interesting derivation that you can get when supports are at different levels the vertical reactions change but the horizontal reaction does not change as long as the sag as defined here remains unchanged so that's an interesting theorem so let's take the same problem which we did earlier and let's have a elevation difference of 1 meter between the left support and right support and let's take the same sag if the sag is the same you can invoke the the theorem we proved in the last slide what is it cables with the same horizontal span l and the same sag h of x subject to the same system of vertical loads located along the horizontal span 10 kN and 20 kN have the same horizontal tension h regardless of differences in the levels of the two end supports whether it is 1 m or 2 m or anything this theory holds good that's a very interesting theory which means don't recalculate h whatever we calculated in the first problem you can do it the hard way you'll still get the same answer it still holds good why should you do more work yeah any question so why should you do more work you already did work you earned money there this is extra very easy to do and then only this changes how does it change this will increase by h into 1 meter divided by 7 and this will reduce by that amount okay so you can get that and then you can get all the others now we look at cable subject to distributed load this is a suspension bridge this is the golden gate bridge one of the oldest and most famous bridges something very interesting now that we've come to bridges just for a change in topic uh, how many lanes of traffic do you think this has hmm you think 12 lanes huh I don't know maybe it, maybe you're right in 1937 you had so many cars plying did you have cars at all yeah i think you had cars but you also had probably horse carriages or you know so why did you have this multi even now bridges we really have 12 lanes right how many lanes we normally have 6 12 lanes so why do we have uh, 
how did they did they have were they visionaries that you know in future there will be so many cars and you need so much of traffic and which is actually true now or they accidentally made these lanes <coughs> yes let me hear some answers from you we are don't forget them the real subject is structural engineering structural analysis suppose you help us in structural engineering. so what is the secret Tell clearly, tell clearly. Till now, conveniently, we drew these cables in a vertical plane. But as she rightly said, there is a heavy wind load acting. Huh? Why is it called Golden Gate, by the way? This was the entry to California, in those days, you've seen movies like McKenna's Gold and all that. So people wanted gold. Even today, people want gold only. Man has not changed. <laughs> okay. And uh, there was gold available there. And so this was a gateway to get the gold. Even now, that's why all you guys rush to California to <laughs> Silicon Valley. That's a new gold. Okay. Right. So... Um, this is subject to heavy winds and for a normal bridge this is close to a, a kilometer less than a kilometer let's say you have a, I don't know what what's the actual span of this bridge any idea 700 meters whatever let's say you have a 700 meter bridge how much depth of girder you need for a normal bridge, a truss bridge? Let's make it smaller, 500 meters. How much depth of girder do you need? Uh, 500 meters means half a kilometer, yeah? L by, L by 10, that's what we know, that makes it uh, workable. So 500 <laughs> meters means how deep should the bridge be? 50 meters. So nobody builds a bridge like that, right? So what, in India especially, how do you, you never have such deep. You have sh shallow trusses, right? How do you manage? Well, you put piers at regular intervals and reduce the span. If you want to give maximum 5 meters, 50 meters span. That's how you do it. But that you can do in rivers where you can access the river bed. In a sea, you can't do it. So this is very ambitious. And your supports are only at the two ends. That's the beauty of this bridge. Now, the beauty of the suspension girder is this can be very high. But you're raising not the whole bridge and you're at the shore and these are called pylons. They can be very high. And what you want is to increase the sag to the maximum amount possible. So you'll have the bridge, the, the cable practically hugging the deck at the middle. And the level difference between this point and this point, that is HC, that should be as high as possible. That's how you quickly evaluate the size of the cable. How do you get the size of the cable? Yes? You are saying the entire load of this is being borne as a distributed load on the cable. What's the shape of the cable? If it's a simply supported bridge subject to UDL, what's the shape? Parabola. So you make this also parabola. Right? And what's the bending moment maximum in a simply supported beam? WL squared. That's one formula you'll never forget. Even if all structural analysis you forget. WL squared by 8, you'll never forget. Now, all you have to do is to divide that by the sag. Whatever sag you can get, divide by that sag. What do you end up with? You'll get the horizontal thrust. Where? Everywhere. Where will the 
normal force be maximum? At the support. How much will it be? Well, whatever the load is, WL by 2 will go here. So that squared plus H squared will give you the action. That's how these calculations were done. In one sheet of paper, today nobody will even think that it's possible. So no, no, stat output I need, I don't know. That's how it was done. And they had the courage to build it. And then you have to make sure it's anchored properly. Okay, we'll look into that a little later. But you see, this is the dim. You say cables, what is there to learn? This is the application. When? Almost 100 years back, they cracked it. Very beautiful. Now, the reason why made, they made this wide is because they knew there were heavy wind loads acting. Right? And this will bend like a horizontal beam in, the, in this direction. And you need sufficient depth. Of course, the loads are not as high as the gravity load. You need depth. You need stiffness. And that's how you ended up with 12 lanes. <laughs> that is sheer accident. But you need it that width. And it's very interesting. We learn from history. Then they became, they got confidence, say, let's build more and more bridges. And they landed up with the first disaster. What is the disaster? The Tacoma Narrows Bridge disaster. What happened there? They made this as sleek as possible. See, everybody wants to make things as sleek as possible, as light as possible. So they reduce this width. So why waste money? Anyway, traffic is not there. And then they and they correctly estimated the wind load and all that, but they didn't anticipate a new phenomenon. What is that phenomenon? Yeah, there. There, it's a it's a dynamic phenomenon, lateral torsional instability. So you had, and it was at a very low wind speed. Maybe we'll show the video. There's a video available where someone happened to be around to film it. And the cars were, maybe he knew it's going to happen. <laughs> cars were jumping off and down the bridge, and the bridge snapped into two and fell in the water. After that, there was a shock. And then, whatever, you know, L by B they got, they did after that only two, three times that value. Now, we know that there are dynamic issues, flutter related issues, where you can't get simple calculations done. And so today it's mandatory to do a wind tunnel test. And you keep increasing the wind speed and you figure out at what speed the instability takes place. And that speed has to be well below the maximum expected speed. So that's how it goes through a process. We learn from failures. Hmm? So uh, that's interesting. But these days, luckily, and this bridge is still there, they only worried about one type of failure caused by? Not Karosh. They'll take care of their painting. They're spending a lot of money. The man-made failure. What is going to happen? And others are also equally waiting to... What kind of failure? Terrorist attack. I mean, you, you, that's how the Twin Towers fell down. So that's a fear. And so uh, we live in fear in spite of all the security, all the factors of safety you put, that can happen. Okay, now we'll go simple. Instead of that huge Tacoma Narrows Bridge, we will take our clothesline, a humble clothesline, in which you hang your distributed load. <laughs> the same shirt, instead of putting it um, on a hanger, you put it horizontally and it will take a curved shape. Yes or no? Why will it take a curved shape? Correct answer? Why curved? No, no, correct answer. Why curved? UDL, but that's you are uh, jumping the answer. Why curved? Because the shape of the bending moment diagram is curved. It's a smooth curve. It's not piecewise linear. Piecewise linear only for concentrated loads. Distributed loads, curved. Got it? So, you can derive a fundamental equation. Just like we derived the differential equation for a beam. 
here the geometry is given by the distributed loading so let's go by first principles let's take a small element and let's subject it to a distributed load q of x normally q of x will be constant but let's just assume it's changing and let's take a small element delta x delta y now this is a free body and <clears throat> the only load external load acting is a distributed load you have a normal force here and you'll have a normal force here obviously there will be a change in force because the shear is changing so we'll add to this delta n h is going to be constant that's the rule we, we saw that what will change is v this is v of x and this v of x plus delta v got it and this is your inclination here theta of x and this theta will change with delta theta is this clear very simple now you can write the equation of equilibrium very simple first thing you say is sigma fy equal to 0 <coughs> you will find that v v will cancel this delta v divided delta v is equal to q into delta x right and if you take delta x to the limit you can say dv by dx is equal to q of x right which is the same equation you get in a beam except that in a beam we put s right we don't put v okay good now let me ask you is this v the shear force in the cable no it's not and don't tell me it's because cable cannot resist shear that's also true shear is always normal to the longitudinal axis this is the definition of shear v is the vertical component of the force so don't mix up the two in the beam equation it was ds by dx and there s and v were the same here it's not the same okay so one equation we got now let's write one more equation we say tan theta see you take the triangle of forces this is the normal force this is the vertical force this is the horizontal force this is the resultant n is the resultant of v and h but the geometry also has the same theta right so if we call this y tan theta is dy by dx got it yes or no so if the ratio is 1 and y dash the hypotenuse will be square root of 1 plus y dash squared now we know h and we know v so <coughs> we can take similar triangles and say that v is h into dy by dx why because v to h is dy by dx to 1 same similar triangle so if you take that similar triangle and you say that tan theta is this divided by this is also this divided by this you will end up with this equation got it so you got a lovely relationship vx is equal to h into y dash right you can also get it from here it's the same thing now you substitute this here and if you substitute for v here you will have the second derivative coming here right so you have h into d squared y by dx squared is equal to q of x this same equation if you plug in there and that's your fundamental equation a differential equation which gives you the geometry of the cable in terms of its curvature and you also know this relationship now let's take a simple case which is a practical case where q of x is equal to q naught is q of x always equal to q naught take the example of the suspension bridge yes if you assume that the weight of the girder is uniformly distributed it's fairly okay uh, there are other reasons we'll explore that in the when we do suspension bridges but let's say you drape a sari on a clothesline can you say it's q of x equal to q naught yes or is it an approximation or you take the self weight of the cable alone is q of x equal to q naught now think and answer don't just agree to everything 
No. Then how will you write it? So, if you have a cable, it is, is uh, prismatic, then probably for self weight, the correct thing to write is Q of S. The curved length is constant. Right? Don't you agree? See, you have a cable like this. This is X and this is S. The actual weight is uniformly distributed in this direction, not in this direction. So you have to be clear about uniformly distributed along the projected horizontal length versus uniformly distributed along the curved length. They are, they are completely different things. Self weight is distributed along the curved length. And what's the shape you get? It's not a parabola, it's a, it's called catenary, named after the word catena, which means chain. So if you take a necklace and you hold it like that, the shape you get is catenary. But if you have a suspension bridge, then uh, Q of X is equal to Q, not is correct. And parabola will be the correct equation. You should know this difference. The difference between the catenary and parabola is not that great. So you can, an approximation is possible. Okay. Provided you get the total length, total weight correct, there is not an issue. Alright. So let's take the suspension bridge case and we are saying this is constant, uniformly distributed along the horizontal span. And let's assume the two supports are at the same level. And uh, you have a cable like this and so this maximum uh, level difference is the sag h and we apply these equations and you'll find the results are very elegant this, how, this is the fastest way to design the cable the bending moment in the mid span m0 of x is q0 l squared by 8 and divide by sag Straight away gives you H, so you got this, you got that, you got everything. And you can prove its parabola. So this we got from the knowledge of statics we already have in all these slides. We didn't come to geometry. Right? But we can guess that this is parabola straight away because the bending moment distribution is parabolic. But we'll prove it through geometry also. How we'll invoke this differential equation that we have. Okay, d squared y by dx squared is q of x, which is q naught divided by h. How do you solve this equation? It's a differential equation. You integrate once, and you integrate once more, and you apply the boundary conditions, you will get a parabolic equation. Right? Uh, it's easy if you choose your origin at the lowest point, then all your constants will vanish. We call that x equal to 0, y is equal to 0, and at x equal to 0, y dash is also 0. So you will find all the constants will go, you have a simple equation. So q0 and h are constants. y is proportional to x squared, classic parabola. This is, look at this equation, y is equal to ax squared. Beautiful equation, simple equation, and classic parabolic equation. And h is 8, q0 l squared by 8h, so you can substitute there. And uh, you know that the maximum cable tension will be the resultant of this and this. And you can substitute and you can write n max also in terms of horizontal thrust. And uh, rewrite this if you substitute q0 uh, like this and bring in h, h will come out. So this is a lovely equation which will straight away give you the maximum. So for a parabolic, for a, a cable subjected to a uniformly distributed load along the projected horizontal span, everything is known. It's child's play. That is how suspension bridges were uh, analyzed and designed. Now, 
we've done this and you can get a, now we need one more thing we want to know we want to order the cable because it costs money I must know the length of cable how do I get the length of the cable well I go by first principles okay I can approximate like this and so my length of cable I just have to integrate for one half and if I integrate this quantity and I substitute y dash as this this is a formula for integration and remember the end result it's a parabola you have to integrate you will get the length of the cable is the horizontal span L into 1 plus 8 H squared by 3 L squared. Remember this formula. That's how you order your cable length. Okay. So you've got the length of the cable. So you've got all you need for construction. And everything is known. Okay. So we, we've got, we came here. And we understood this. Now, this is also interesting. And let me ask you this way. You want to buy something for your wife. And you want to gift something that she likes. What will you gift? Typical Indian, you will mind, you have you somehow got a lot of money because of a suspension bridge which was recently built. <laughs> so your mind is always thinking of parabolas. So you go and you, you go to a jewelry shop and gold chain. Then you ask, normally the first question you ask is, what will you ask? How much does it cost? Looks good. Then you visualize it draped on your spouse. Then they are clever, they want to sell more. They, they already figured that you got some money. So this costs a few lakhs. They say, this looks even better. Actually, it's a longer chain. Now, you know your cable analysis. I want to ask you, if I have this chain, the certain length, and they want to sell me a longer chain, will it be the same parabola or will it be a different parabola? So let's look at it. Let's say I make this 2H. What's the relationship between L1 and L2? Of course, you have to pay more for this necklace. It will weigh more also. Weight will be a function of height or span? No, of length. They will weigh it. They don't believe in any calculations. Weight, and they for so much uh, kilogram weight, you give so much money. Yes or no? Now I am asking you a simple question. What is the relationship between these quantities? L1, L2, H. I have just increased H into 2H. You tell. When you go to jewelry shop, <laughs> it's good to know all this. You can't fool you because you know. Sometimes if you don't have the money and they show you this, you ask them to show this. This is what you can afford. Nothing wrong. Okay. So let's compare these two fellows. Okay, this is Q naught L1 by 2, this is Q naught L2 by 2. Got it? What about H? The, the, this load is the same Q naught because the thickness of the necklace is the same. Right? So that is the same. So how much will it be? Of course, we are approximating the catenary with a parabola. That approximation we are doing. So what do you think will happen? What is this H? compared to this H. Can you tell me? Well, 
Well, common sense, if the span is L2, it will be, what will be H when the sag is doubled is the question. Will the H be also doubled capital H? Yeah? It become half? I want you to figure out. Come on. So much of spoon feeding. At least this you must tell me. This is H1, this is H2. This is L1, this is L2. This is small h, this is 2h. That's all you need to know. We'll end with this. I want to do, I want to close this and then we'll continue in the next session. Just simple question. Will H be doubled? Will it remain the same? Will it become half? Or will it be something else? It will remain same. That's surprising. Well, first of all, you should know you're dealing with the same parabola. Let me take the small necklace and superimpose. Will I get the same necklace? Imagine. Will I get the same necklace? Yes. Same parabola. In your mind, can you see that? Yes. Oh, then that secret is the same. So, you know the equation is Y is Q0. This we've derived already. You will find that the curvature, the second derivative is a constant. And it is given by 8h by l squared. If small h is increased or decreased, l will suitably get modified in keeping with the parabolic equation. But capital H, which is q naught by y double dash, always remains unchanged. So the horizontal component, you can imagine if the, the horizontal tension here and here will be the same. The same cable you can put there. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, for you would have thought it gets doubled. No, it doesn't get doubled. The length gets adjusted. Is it clear? Okay, we will stop here. So, how does it get adjusted? If H is doubled, root 2 times. So, L2 will be root 2 times L1. So, I could have asked you that relation. What's the relation between L2 and L1? L2 will be root 2 times L1 because capital H will remain the same. And so you can work out H2 will also be Q0 L1 squared by 8H. Same answer. Okay, you can plug this value in and see what happens. That's just interesting. So H2 is equal to H1. Alright, we'll stop there and then we'll talk of what happens if it's an unsymmetric cable in the next class. Okay, we'll stop here. Thank you.